Hello everyone. Isn't it unbelievable how time flies? Two and a half years. It's the time it took me to come back since my last update video. And here I am today to tell you about everything that has been happening in my life during those past two and a half years. I have gone through a very rough phase where my whole life seemed to have crumbled apart. I can definitely say that it's been the most challenging time of my life. So much has happened that I completely let myself get overwhelmed with the events and needed some time to process them. Reason why I kind of stopped making videos. But I'm so happy to be back now and to start telling you about everything that happened to me. I started writing those words from a tiny coastal town in Ecuador where I lived for a few months in the countryside surrounded and living to the rhythm of nature, observing it change throughout the seasons. But in order for you to understand everything, I'll have to go back to where I left you in my last video. The last time I posted, I was about to leave Mexico where I had to spend six months. From the dreamy Bacalar, where it really felt like home, it was a total change of scenery as I then flew to Northern California, where I had found a job working in a cannabis farm. I ended up living in a yurt for three months with total strangers, in the middle of the forest, three hours away from civilization. At first, Nico was here. And after being apart for two months, we were able to spend three weeks together before we had to leave again, trying to enjoy the beautiful landscapes and the warmth. But as the time passed by, the season started to change. Nico left, and I started feeling the most lonely I've ever felt in my life. The heat and the sunny weather slowly started shifting to let the rain and the cold take its place. Je vais vous montrer tout de suite à quoi ressemble mon quotidien ici depuis quelques jours. L'hiver est arrivé et la pluie aussi. <rire> si je reste assez longtemps, je vais voir la neige. J'espère que je serai déjà partie. On a la cuisine dehors. Tout est trempé. Heureusement, on est à la forêt. On a les arbres qui nous protègent un peu de la pluie, mais tout est trempé. Everything was outside. The shower, the bathroom. Living in the yurt with no source of heat simply became impossible and staying warm was my absolute priority. Apart from the cold, living there was far from being easy. There were many things I had to take care of, like making sure we would not run out of electricity since it was working on diesel but also checking that the water tank was always full. Unfortunately, the people I was working and lived with didn't do much there. Their relationship with my roommate started deteriorating more and more each day. Respect gave way to competition and greed. Living in this place that looked so peaceful on the outside simply became torture. But as I thought things could not get worse than they already were, the events took a dramatic shift. While I was there, the industry had a massive crash and many farmers started to go bankrupt. Everyone started panicking as we weren't getting paid and at some point, everybody left except me. I waited and waited for a few weeks for my money, being completely alone in the yurt, with no car, not being able to go anywhere, shattered by the idea that this money I was counting so much on was simply gone. I ended up not being paid half of what I had worked for. That money represented my dream to buy a piece of land and to create a community. It's devastated and sad that I left California and then flew to Ecuador where Nico was waiting for me. Only a few days after I arrived, we ended up very randomly in a reality show that wanted to feature seven people transitioning from the city to the countryside. This opportunity came at a perfect time since we really wanted to learn more about permaculture and bioconstruction. After many hours on the bus and a long hike across the mountains, I was mesmerized by the place I would get to call home for the next month. Angela, 
a medicine woman and spiritual guide welcomed us during a beautiful sunset ceremony where we all introduced each other. We did amazing things like making our own sugar from sugar cane we would pick, then cut with the machete, then with the help of the donkeys bring them all the way to the extracting machine to extract its juice, which is incredibly delicious, then cook it at a very high temperature, Let it sit until it finally solidifies into what we call panela here in South America, which is nothing else than sugar in its purest form. And right before it turns solid, they call it melcocha, which is just a healthy and natural caramel candy. We also built a chicken coop, which was definitely a first one for me. During this month, I used so many tools I had never used before and felt so satisfied for being able to build things with my own hands. I also got to milk a cow for the first time and after being lactose intolerant for seven years, I was finally able to enjoy dairy without getting sick. We also learned about cacao, and for the cacao addict that I am, I was far from expecting how much work was behind it. Cacao is a big part of the Ecuadorian culture, and a lot of what we consume in other parts of the world comes from there. And the fruit's flavor is from another world. And only a few people know that the chocolate they eat actually comes from that red or yellow oval-shaped fruit. We planted, harvested, worked with the local community, bargained what we had for things we needed. The experience, even though it was hard, as I had just worked very intensively for the past three months, was life-changing. There is such a special feeling witnessing the whole process of the food we consume, and generally buy in supermarket, seeing how nature provides it, and how much work there is behind the final product. So much respect for the elderly who worked all day, hands in the soil, without even once complaining, providing for both their family and community. After this incredible time spent in the lushy green mountains of the southern part of Ecuador, we headed to the coast to simply rest and see what opportunities were gonna come our way. Rainy season was still here, and we first ended up in a friend's house for a couple of weeks. It was hard to find our feet in this new place at first, since the fatigue of moving from one place to another was starting to show. We started exploring the surroundings, and we soon realized the scarcity of water on the coast of Ecuador was a big deal. While the place where we were living seemed abundant and still had plenty of water in its river, especially during rainy season, more and more rivers in the surrounding areas, which so many people depend on, were starting to dry and to disappear, leaving people highly dependent on organizations for their water supply. So we grabbed our cameras and started recording what locals had to say about it. Were they even aware about how big this issue was? Were there measures being taken to save their river? I really hope I'll be able to make a more in-depth video about this important topic. We also found out about a remarkable project that's literally changing the educational system in Ecuador. We met the owner of this alternative school we discovered and I will soon start working on this next documentary, which will hopefully be online soon.
This year also marked a big turn in my spiritual journey, as I had many experiences with medicinal plants. After falling in love with its taste in the mountains of the south of Ecuador, I got to experience cacao on a whole new level. Cacao is actually an ancient plant medicine that holds the power to open our heart, allowing us to deeply connect to our true essence and those around us. Another medicine I got to experience is rape, el abuelo, the sacred tobacco frequently used by shamans and tribes from the Amazonian jungle. It's a beautiful healing medicine that induces a very deep meditative state and helps us cleanse and purify our pineal gland, allowing us to bring order and balance to our mind. My encounter with ayahuasca and huachuma is something I'll definitely remember my whole life too. At that moment, I didn't know it yet, but I was entering one of the most transformational time of my life. We then lived and volunteered for a few months in a hostel facing the ocean. Being back into the hostel life was weird at times and tiring, but it was great to socialize again with other travelers. The chores were pretty simple. Making breakfast for the guests, cleaning their rooms, doing check-ins and check-outs, but he allowed me to not have to pay any rent for three months and have a lot of free time, and of course, to surf. We then headed to the north to keep exploring the coast, and that's where everything got a little more complicated. Hi everyone, so it feels very real right now to be in front of the camera and to be honest I've postponed this video so many times because it felt so uncomfortable telling you everything that happened, everything that I've been going through. I just, I've been postponing this for many months but right now I'm about to close it I was gonna say chapter but it's literally a book of of my life and I want to move on and to really tell you everything that happened I, I've been going through the roughest time of my life and it's been a wild ride honestly and I'm only able to do this now because I'm on the other side of that super dark tunnel where I can finally see the light and that I'm finally better. So as you can tell I'm wearing coat right now so yes I'm not in a warm place anymore um, but before explaining to you where I am at the moment and how I got here I need to explain everything that happened in between. So when Nico and I left this hostel where we were volunteering in Ecuador. We headed to a place called Canoa, still on the coast. And a guy that Nico met, a Brazilian guy, invited us there. It was house sitting over there. And there was a beach, lots of surf. So we said, okay, let's go. But we were just so tired, tired of, tired of being on the road tired of not having a place of ours, trying to work on our new documentary with an improvised office. <laughs> it's, 
yeah we're super tired of not having our own space and not being able to work properly and yeah we have all our stuff in plastic bags everywhere it's just such a mess and it's impossible to be tidy here can't wait to have our own space tired of having to volunteer and we just wanted like a place we could call home and start growing food and we when we got there we thought this is a cool place and it's there's a lot of surfing so why not here so in order to find a piece of land we needed a car so the first step that we took was to go about three hours away from where we were and we went to look for a car which we found and we came back to Kenoa with a car and started looking for a piece of land. So that was a big, 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 big step for us. Um, also very scary. And honestly, it kind of felt like rushed, but we were just tired and also afraid about what could potentially happen in the world after COVID. Like we kind of didn't know what was gonna happen. In case that we're gonna like shut down the entire world again, we just wanted a place where we could just be. Where we could just be, literally. So we went back to Kenoa and we started looking and by word of mouth, we found a very cheap place where we could just uh, build a little house. So today we're visiting a land and I've lost count of how many lands we've been visiting for the past few weeks. But yeah, we met this guy very randomly. He's actually, uh, the father of the boyfriend of the girl that works at the hostel where we're staying at so he said that he had a piece of land for us so we came here and it's incredible there everything grows super fertile we never imagined that this would be the place where we would stay like forever but having like this little house near the beach sounded super nice and where we could just rest and we bought the land <laughs> We're the proud owners of a new land, our first land. And it was like financially speaking very hard for me because I didn't have the whole money I wanted to because I didn't get paid everything I was owned in the US. So I was still super tight with money and Nico had more money than I did. So at some point I had to leave to work and I actually posted about this on Instagram and I asked a lot of people if they knew like where I could work, if I could work in the US or Canada or anywhere. And something came up in Canada and I flew there. So we bought the land, bought literally the pillars of the house. So today is a very big day because we're starting the construction of the house. I left and it was super hard for me it was heartbreaking because it was just the beginning of a new chapter and I already had to leave but I just couldn't do anymore without money so a friend's friend actually a friend that I met in California an amazing friend knew he had a friend who worked in a cannabis farm in Canada so I went there and I started working I stayed about four months and I made a bit of money, but after like a month of being there, so it was supposed to be the whole season, uh, we got laid off until harvest. And it was a huge plantation, five hectares of wheat growing. And at first we were just deleafing and doing like working in, in like farm jobs. But after we just got laid off and we were told that we should come back for harvest. So when you're in Canada during this time of the year, there is a lot of fruit picking and I started doing fruit picking. I started picking apples and grapes 
and I did pruning. I also did, uh, I also worked in a packing house. Honestly, it was very intense for me because the uncertainty of it all, not knowing how much I was going back to Ecuador with, like I had no idea how much I was gonna make. Um, and life is very expensive in Canada. And so finally harvest came, but so was the snow and the cold weather. Oh my God, it's snowing. Oh, yo me voy a caer, weón. Ya ni veo dónde está la la escalera. And the house where we were staying at was not insulated, so I basically lived in this house where there were no walls, no, it was like a roof, but it was no insulation. So it started snowing inside the house. And I have never been that cold in my entire life. Not even when I was in Patagonia camping. I was freezing. There was no time where I could just rest and relax my body. I was always tensed because I was working outside with minus 15 and the house was also minus 15 Celsius. It was cold all the time. There was no moment where you could just relax your body. So yesterday I washed my underwear. Just wanted to show you. It's, they're frozen. <laughs> and taking a shower, not even talking about it. It was terrible. At some point, everything got frozen inside the house, like even the water, nothing came out of anything. It was just like, we couldn't even go to the bathroom anymore. The water doesn't, can't open anymore. We have no water. So they moved us to a motel to finish the harvest. We were basically harvesting frozen weed, so it was just like working in, in the snow all the time. And I had no idea, but at that particular moment, the stress, the certainty, the cold, I destroyed my health. I went back to Ecuador completely destroyed. I started feeling very bad and Nico was waiting for me to do stuff on the house and I couldn't even work properly because I felt dizzy, my whole body was aching and everything hurt. And at some point I did some blood tests and realized I had an hypothyroidism. So my thyroid was not working properly and it was pretty bad actually the test. So um, at that moment also what happened is that things were not going well with Nico. I stayed about four months in Ecuador doing stuff on the house, trying to be okay, but things were not okay. And I started going to, I had no idea at that moment, but I was starting to fall into this big depression. I was trying to exercise and like just shift my mind, but it was pretty hard. Also the symptoms of hypothyroidism of depression and mental confusion and loss of memory. So there's just like a lot of things that were impacting my mental health at that particular moment. At some point I even went uh, back to where I used to live and in Ecuador and it was like an amazing, amazing time amongst this nightmare I was living. Because at that moment, when I left to go see my friends, I got a call from my sister who said that if I wanted to see my dad, it would be now because she didn't know how long he was gonna be around for. And I, I just felt terrible. So obviously I was gonna go to France and I went. I went to France to see my dad and I had to leave Nico again. So we had just been together again for four months after being separated for four months. But the day I said goodbye to my dad, 
in the hospital, so I had to go back to Paris and my dad was in the south of France. I knew in my heart that it was going to be the last time that I was going to see my dad. And it was. And that same day, I took the train back to Paris and that's when things ended with Nico. So yeah, the same day I said goodbye to my dad, it was the day that things ended with Nico and it was a freaking tough time. Uh, that same moment it was my birthday and it was pretty hard because I didn't even want to celebrate anything. Honestly, I was starting my descent to the abyss, to hell. And I spent the last money I had to go see my dad alive. And I went to Canada to work at that same place from the start that time. So I could just make more money. And I went there. So it was like just pure jet lags, you know, Ecuador, France, and then France, Canada. And after about a week working in Canada, I, it was the day of the eclipse. It was actually the 5th of May. I just, that day I had my last conversation with Nico and again, like the synchronicities. So I said goodbye to Nico for good. And that same night I woke up about 3 a.m. and I saw a text from my sister and she was telling me that my dad had passed away. I have no words to explain how I felt at that moment. My whole world crumbled. I had no money to go to the funerals and I woke up that day like I didn't even sleep anymore. I went straight to work and I just couldn't stop crying. My whole life was completely destroyed. I felt like there was no sense of living anymore. And a good soul actually paid for my ticket. A friend who had just been through the same thing actually gave me the money so that I could go see my dad to his funeral. And I did. So after a week in Canada, I went back to France for a week and then I went back to Canada again. So physically, I was completely exhausted and mentally exhausted and so there started the the real descent to the abyss i didn't see any point of living anymore i've never felt that in my entire life i've never felt that i didn't want to be here i've always been a person that enjoyed life to the fullest and that moment i was I was just, I would wake up in the morning, you know that moment when you wake up, before you, the whole reality catch up with you, when you're still like between sleep and reality, like that was the, just the best few seconds in the day. Then I would just get hit with the reality and being like, whoa, this is my life right now. And I, has, I had spent my whole money on the house and the land. So I lost it all. And I had lost my dad, I had lost my boyfriend. And it's not an easy thing to say, but I think we, we should talk about it more often because it happens to more people than we think. And I never thought it would happen to me, but I started having suicidal thoughts. And not because I don't like life, just, just because the pain was so strong and so unbearable at that moment of my life. The only way I could feel relieved was the thought about not being here anymore. I never thought I could do it. I just knew it would pass and that this would be the greatest lesson of my life, the greatest learning. I just didn't know what to do anymore, honestly. So I started using tools that I had at my disposal. I had been practicing breath work for a little while, so I started doing breath work every day to release all those emotions that were just being stored inside my body and that it would eventually turn as a disease. And I didn't want this to happen. So I started doing breath work super regularly and it was emotionally super strong. I went, I pushed myself very far with breath work and it relieved me so much in so many ways. I started doing exercising every single day also I just knew that it would create dopamine and that 
it would help me go through this phase of my life where nothing had a meaning anymore. And I started microdosing on mushrooms. And one thing that really helped me a lot is THC, you know, because in Canada, taking cannabis in any way is legal. And I started, started taking it and it actually made a huge shift in my mind. One that I did not expect. I received so many beautiful messages. I started writing in my journal and it was like I was receiving messages from the source, from God, from the universe. And I was writing actually at the third person. It was like somebody was talking to me and sending me messages. And I started writing a lot. So journaling has been another tool that helped me immensely during this phase of my life and what helped me a lot also is listening to people that have been through similar things in their life or that have been also at the bottom of the pit and that are sharing their experiences like being on the other side and being well again i'm sharing this today because i know it can help a lot of people too i know that we're many people going through the same phases and we all learn from those phases and we can our learnings can benefit each other so that's why i'm sharing all of this today i really wish my words and my experience could help other people because mental health is not something that's talked about on a daily basis like many people keep that to themselves and it's and it's super important to talk about it but yeah at some point here in canada i thought like i had a regular job a stable job and there were just many things that happened first it was like this invasion of crickets that we thought they were going to destroy the whole plants so we just started putting like a lot of powder on it we're giving food to the grasshoppers and then the fire started so one night at like 1 a.m people came knocking on my door and say to evacuate the place because it was like dangerous and i didn't <laughs> uh, evacuate because fire was not close but at some point it started burning like in front of the house and like all around and it was like, crazy all right i think it's better the sun is living Ooh. I have to hurry. So okay, I'm just gonna focus to finish this story. So the fire was still happening and I started working inside a lab at that particular moment. So inside the lab, the job was basically because it's an extracting place where they just extract THC in like big machines. And our job was literally to break the frozen weed from last year's harvest and that we just would put inside big socks and those socks would go inside the machine to be extracted and turn into live resin wax that go into the vapes so that's what i was doing and it was a very tedious job honestly inside the whole day and not seeing real light and it was hard sometimes like the thing we were using to break the the frozen we was like super hard so my arms sometimes in my hands and were aching you know but apart from that i would just put my headphones and and just listen to podcasts all day i also started creating like a, an amazing friendship with the girl i was working with a mexican girl and honestly it was amazing uh, being with her and sharing our life experiences. But yeah, at some point we were promised to have a job the whole season and from one day to the other, our boss again said, like last year, he said, sorry, from next week, you're not gonna have a job anymore until harvest. And we're like, what? So luckily I had saved a little bit of money, so it was okay, but still I was like a bummer. Why, why is this happening again? And yeah, the firework, going on it was like smoke everywhere and my friends they decided to go to Banff uh, and I went last year also last year was amazing We 
went to those amazing hot springs and it just gave me a break. Honestly, I needed it. Even though I was still in a very bad place, I was still crying a lot and still having those very dark thoughts, I was still feeling that I was getting better. And then we went back to this place and I stayed a little bit alone for a little while. I wanted to edit that video for a very long time, but every time I would just sit in front of the computer and see all the videos with Nico, everything that we had been living together, I would just burst out crying. I would just like close the computer and not being able to edit for another month. So that was that hard. It feels amazing to be able to talk about it without like crying right now. I I'm feel like so much better and then yeah, be, talking about it on the other side feels, oh, thank God. It just everything passes, guys, everything passes. Any bad moment in life comes to an end. So I see I started doing like jobs, creating content for them and making videos. I eventually went back to work outside. So I managed to like work a little bit, but one thing that I knew I didn't want to do was go fruit picking again because it ruined my body last year and I just didn't want to do that. Harvest started again, because that was like two months ago now. So yeah, this is where I am right now. I'm in Canada, I'm in the Okanagan Valley. Harvest was crazy. Yeah, I worked about 60 to 70 hours a week and I started working inside the lab again and doing the socks. <laughs> and, and well, something happened. Oh my God. I was supposed to stay here for another few months and leave with enough money to buy my own piece of land and build my own house, but things didn't go as planned, there is something very, very important that happened. How should I say this? <laughs> so, one of my bosses, there were three, apparently raped one of the Mexican that worked here during harvest. And me and my friend quit. It's a crazy news and we didn't want to work there anymore. Those people were not honest. And honestly, I felt that I was just losing my soul being there. Even if I wasn't doing anything wrong, I was just working there, but being just working inside, not interacting with anyone else than my friend, I felt like I was meant to do much more than this. I was like every single day asking, what am I doing here? And at some point it was not frozen wheat anymore that we were managing. It was kit from the machine, like they were trimming the, the weed. And what was like the leftover of the machine, what we were going to put inside the socks. But it was like this fine dust that would just enter everywhere. So we were just covered by dust all the time. And we started coughing a lot. Like we were starting to damage our health at some point. I was like, okay, I'm here to make money, but this is not worth it. This is not worth my health. And I was going to work backwards. I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. And this thing with my with my boss happened. And I just feel like this is the universe pushing me in another direction that I should just go do something else with my life and that I'm worth much more than this. 
and that life is so precious that all the most precious years of my life I was giving it to that company and I just felt like I need a big change so I'm filming this as I am about to pack my bag tomorrow I'm going to another city for a few days after eight months here I am finally living And then I don't even, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. I have no idea. I was thinking that maybe I would go to Miami, uh, maybe Mexico. I just don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, guys. I have also decided to become a breathwork instructor. So I'm going to take a course which is going to last two months. So I'm going to be able to guide my own sessions, make my own breathwork meditations. That's it. I'm leaving you with uh, this. I know it's a lot to take in. It's also very hard to be sharing my life that way. This is actually the first time I'm doing it in English. Actually, I wrote not a script, but like some all the bullet points that I didn't want to miss, but I didn't even look at it once. I just felt like it would be better if it just flowed and that I would just tell you the stories, uh, the story as I would tell my friends. So I wanted to th say thank you if you stayed up until now. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to me and thank you for the support. I've received many messages from all of you during all those months that I've been out of social media and it means a lot to me, a lot more than you think. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for for being an amazing community. And I will let you know about my next move once I've decided. I feel like my brain is freezing right now and that I can't even take a decision. I will let you know for sure about my decision. Mwah. Thank you for being here. Bye, guys. Mm -hmm.